it kind of gets us into the sphere of OPEX versus CAPEX, which is like magic terms that I keep hearing since like 2012. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, hey, does anybody actually know what those mean outside of financial circles? Because sometimes I get the impression it's just like a magic incantation. If I had a dollar for use. every bad definition of those two <laughs> I've gotten, it would be amazing. And like, can we treat our cloud bill as CAPEX? No. Well, yes, actually, but careful. Here are the problems with doing that. And in practice, though, it's it also is something we're seeing across the board, even in cloud environments. Let's look at a broad spectrum here, where on one end of it, I'm running old, legacy, stable data centers, you know, like IBM Cloud. And I, it cost me way too much to build something out there. But once I've built the building, signed the leases, bought the, bought the servers, I can now amortize out what it's going to cost me for the next five years to a high degree of confidence. On the other end of the spectrum, so you wind up modernizing and evolving forward, becoming more cloud native, which is something different to everyone. And on the other end of it, you wind up with something full on serverless. Well, at that point, what is it going to cost you for the next uh, for the next however long? The answer instead becomes a function of how many users you have. And the numbers are smaller, but it's also going to be much more highly variable. At least that's the polite theory. In practice, your cloud bill is very often less predicated upon how many customers you have and more predicated upon how many engineers you have. Hmm. I, so I do want to dig into that a little bit because that's an interesting shift in perspective. Instead of having these fixed known costs where the only real variation is going to be like, oh, we used more power this month than we normally do. Now there's still some of those in cloud too. For example, like right. it doesn't matter if you have one engineer or 50 engineers, you still need the Jira server. Now I'm sure that depending <laughs> on whether you have a CI CD company like Circle CI or whatnot sponsoring you this week, then they're going to say, no, you don't. You can use this service instead. Sure, it's an illustrative example. There are some baseline things you need to, to wind up servicing customer one. The question is, is what a customer two can three and four add incrementally to that? Right, but you depending on how you have all your auto scaling and, and different stuff set up, you could potentially have your costs skyrocket if suddenly your product becomes hugely popular and all these customers are really interested in, or your website becomes hugely popular for some reason, you're splashed on the front page yeah. of Hacker News or something, and you have no control over that side of the equation, except maybe putting limitations on uh, rate limiting or something like that on, on the yes website. Yes and no, but that becomes a business question in its own right. For example, if this thing hits the front page of Hacker News, do I want it to A, wind up spiking my bill, or B, do I want it to fail to scale and stop being able to serve traffic? <laughs> and in seriousness, that is a valid business question. It's mm -hmm. in some cases, yep. it's a, I have this free thing. Yeah, I don't want to necessarily devote huge resources when it winds up getting a bunch of traffic that may or may not be the kind of traffic I want. So understanding what your scaling model looks like is important here. In most cases, I kind of like eyeballs, so I tend to optimize for, yeah, come on in. Look at my nonsense. You'll love it. I do anyway. <laughs> right, right. The theory is that in some longer term, that's going to generate more money for you. But if that increased traffic would not result in additional revenue or customers, then it probably doesn't make sense to scale in that in that way. So it's it's a weird question to to have to think about because of the limitless capacity that AWS or, or Azure has for your for your traffic and your applications. Oh, people ask me sometimes we're trying to do planning on our side. How many uh, blog posts do I think are going to go viral this year? Uh, <laughs> if I could answer that question in advance, I would have a way different job. <laughs> It's, it's one of those, yeah, we, we don't know. We honestly don't know the answer to most of these things. It's, and the truth of it is, as we talk about auto scaling and the rest, what we see very often is companies talk about auto scaling, which makes them feel much better about not auto scaling. We saw this very clearly during the pandemic in the early days where user traffic dropped off a cliff because it turns out people aren't you know buying event tickets or whatnot anymore or going to uh, restaurants. But the infrastructure line was pretty much the same month over month. Interesting. What's the story here? When people talk about the cloud being elastic and uh, scaling on demand, you ever notice they only talk about that being scaling up? It's never about, and when your business craters, you can shrink down and not overpay for things. Yeah, not a compelling marketing message for one. I don't see Andy Jassy at reInvent talking about when your business takes a dive, but it's I can, but it is something people don't think about. We no, always talk I mean, about how to scale up on databases. How do you scale down to something smaller when traffic winds up going away? People in a more regular type example, there's 
ebbs and flows in your business over the course of the day. And ideally, you would oh, look at that same number hour by hour. If we're talking like at, at 12 o'clock noon, your time and 12 o'clock midnight, your time, you're seeing the exact same level of spend on an hour by hour basis. That's usually an indication of one of two things. Either you're not actually tracking these, uh, what your user is doing and uh, growing or shrinking the environment uh, accordingly, or you're doing some sort of intelligent usage to just, okay, yeah, the web servers aren't doing anything at midnight, but that's when the big data science analysis runs off. And in practice, you take a look at the variance, it's about mm, give or take 20%. People wind up seeing the swings there. We very rarely see folks going from nothing in the middle of the night and uh, effectively zero infrastructure cost to all the traffic during the day. There's always that baseline level that is always there 24 seven charging you by the hour or by the second, depending on how your provider meters and life goes on. The I worst part of it all is, <laughs> oh yeah, that's the story we tell ourselves, isn't it? Uh, 60% of spend globally on AWS is EC2. So that's it. <laughs> given that they have 200, <laughs> given they have 200 services, yeah, add S3, RDS, data transfer, and uh, mm -hmm. and a disk storage, and you're into the 80s. But yeah, there's a Correct. very long tail. These are also giant numbers. Let's not kid ourselves here. Yeah. 